I'm Mindy Driscoll and this is my module two reflection. The first question, how am I using theories of self to understand what shapes and motivates students in my class with the goal of more effective instruction? For this, when I look at what motivates my students, I think it's important that I understand my students and their confidence within my curricular area. And that comes down to self-efficacy. Self-efficacy, according to our textbook on page 109, is the judgment of one's ability to perform a task within a specific domain. I always have to handle this situation where I have students who come in and say, well, I just am not good at history, or I don't like history, and therefore I'm going to get a bad grade in this class. It's like they've already decided that they can't do well. And I think that this is really frustrating. It's something that we're faced with a lot more frequently than we'd like to admit. And I think it's a, a situation that needs to be handled. Students need to realize that um, putting forth a little bit of effort, that uh, putting connections together and trying can make a big difference. I think that they too frequently judge themselves too quickly and that um, if they were to put a little effort into there, that maybe they would be a little bit more confident. And I think self-confidence really rages into the self-efficacy. For me, self-esteem is not usually an issue. I have very confident students but unfortunately, I think that self-efficacy, that, that ability to reform in this area, this history area, is usually lacking for a lot of students. And what this does for me then is it kind of challenges me um, as a teacher to try to, to motivate students. And I think that that's something that's very important. When we look at motivation. We have to look at, you know, how confident do the students feel. Um, self-efficacy also ind indirectly affects uh, future willingness to engage in tasks. I try to make my class very challenging. I try to make it um, not hard, but I want them to push themselves to make those connections. And if students don't feel confident in history or they, they just don't think that they can do it, then obviously they're not going to try something that's extremely challenging. You know, um, history isn't always easy, especially when we look at po political trends and economic things. And so if students are not feeling very confident, then they're not necessarily going to be willing to try something. And unfortunately, then if they don't try it, then they lose points for those things or um, they check out on it when they could be finding out some very valuable information. Uh, efficacy also improves performance and strategy use. So students who come in with a strong self-efficacy, that they feel confident in their ability to perform in the domain, in my case, history, uh, that they are going to improve in their performance and they're going to improve in their strategy use. This is not to say that students are going to be straight A students, but that they are, if they believe that they can do well, if they try to do well, then their performance is going to improve. Um, that they're going to use the strategies I ask them to use. Maybe not completely effectively, maybe not to the top level that, they, that other students will, but they will do better. I think that part of self-efficacy is also attached to teacher efficacy. Students need to see that I, as a teacher, am willing to work and be challenged. Teacher efficacy, to me, is kind of like this constant push for self-improvement as a teacher, knowing that I am never done learning how to be a better teacher. Um, the textbook talks about the fact that, you know, teachers who are too confident have a very uh, poor teacher efficacy because they're not willing to realize change. I also, I also think it's really important when we look at teacher efficacy to realize that teachers who have a strong efficacy value student autonomy and control. I know this is something that I need to work on because I know that it's important that students take control, but relinquishing control as a teacher is very difficult to do. We like to, you know, feel really confident that I have, you know, we, we equate control with good classroom management. But we need to be able to separate the two, and I think that's where I have a little bit more difficulty, especially with my junior high students, because they tend to take control and run with it, and then I, as a teacher, lose classroom management. But if students can take control over their own learning, if they feel like they have some control over it, they take some ownership, they tend to do a little bit better. I also see that, according to the textbook, that teacher efficacy uh, means that their teachers are more likely to encourage and praise. And this is something that I also really need to work on. This summer I've been coaching varsity softball, and I equate, you know, coaching with teaching uh, a sport. And this is an area where I've really been struggling this summer with my encouragement and my praise, but I think it's because I haven't felt very confident this summer in my coaching abilities. Uh, we aren't doing as well as maybe we have in the past, um, but at the same time, a teacher who realizes that they're struggling is a teacher who maybe uh, is ready for that change to happen. Also, when we look at student motivation and student success, we need to look at attribution theory. And I think the attribution theory really helps us recognize that students are individuals. In our textbook on page 116, it talks about attribution theory being the framework for understanding why people respond so differently to the same outcome. I think we're, uh, we don't necessarily always consider our students to be individuals. We expect them to come up to the same answer 
um, using the method that we provided them. But not all of our students' brains work the same way. Um, they think very differently. And because of that, they could come up to any number of different results using any number of different ways to get there. Does that always mean they're wrong? Maybe, maybe not. But it's really important for us to understand that our students are different, that they will respond differently, and that we need to encourage that differentiation of uh, the, the differences between our students um, and, and try to uh, help them, maybe if they're not reaching it properly, to find that right direction using um, kind of their methods of thinking. In order to help students kind of take control over this and to be more motivated, um, autonomy is really important. If you want a student to do something for themselves, they're going to have to feel like they have some control, some personal um, choice in it all. And I think when we look at uh, when autonomy, it really comes down to intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. If you have strong autonomy, you've got strong intrinsic motivation, strong personal motivation. You want to do well just because you want to do well. But unfortunately, I think today, um, we would be really lucky to find a whole class of students who are intrinsically motivated, and I know it would make our jobs a lot simpler, but unfortunately they're ext extrinsically motivated. They want those external rewards, the extra credit, the free days, the party days, and those are some things that I try to stay away from. In fact, I don't even offer extra credit because I tell them if you've done it the first time, then there shouldn't be a reason to need it for the, um, later down the road. So I think if we eliminate the extrinsic side of it, we have also, at the same time, though, have to find ways to intrinsically motivate our students. In order to help our students to, to gain personal control, it's important to give them student choice. Um, maybe not a choice in what they learn, but how they learn. The projects, the activities, the um, choices and the types of assignments that they do. Uh, the ways that they're assessed, some different things like that. We also need to scrutinize teacher and student expectations. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we need to analyze ourselves. What do me, what do I as the teacher hope to get out of it? What do the students hope to get out of it? And find some compromising ground between um, minimizing the extrinsic side of the rewards, uh, making sure things are criteria based in evaluation, uh, making sure that we know exactly what's expected, providing rubrics or checklists, and then also providing intrinsic motivation, helping those students realize that they um, they need to do it for themselves not to get the, the external reward. The second question, how can I use theories of creativity and problem solving to make my instruction more problem focused and authentic? This is something that I've been trying to do even more lately um, with history is making it more problem based, having students get in their hands on uh, and experiencing history and then connecting it to today. Uh, with this whole side of um, problem solving, I think problem solving really centers on thinking, creativity, thinking. And Dewey really lends himself to that on the first part, in the very beginning of his article. He says that thinking signifies everything that, that, as we say, is in our heads or goes through our minds. And I think this is really important and, and it really gets me thinking, I, Dewey gets me thinking, um, about the importance of thought. And the fact that, you know, thought can be good, it can be bad, it can be helpful, it can be hurtful. But the thing is, is that we are always thinking and sometimes maybe thinking too much or not thinking enough. But as Dewey puts it, it's the thoughts that are attached to belief that are the most important. We need to encourage students to keep on thinking because eventually they're going to attach belief to it. And those beliefs are going to get strung together into concepts and those concepts are going to make the stories happen. Um, the thinking eventually will lead to reflection and reflection is really what we want them to do. Uh, Dewey says that reflection is judgment suspended during further inquiry. If you're thinking, you're investigating. And if you're reflecting, you're investigating on what you've already done. And you don't make a final judgment until the very end, until you've reached the end of your inquiry. And I think that's a really important tool to teach kids, um, especially as we're dealing with problem solving. You want to investigate all the different avenues and come up to an end result. We want students to, be reflect to um, engage in reflective judgment. We want them to analyze the problem. You know, investigate the whole situation. Uh, then, once they've done the investigation, reach an informed conclusion, come up to a solid end, and then back it up. I think that's the one thing that students are really missing is the backing it up side of it. This doesn't happen just because it happens, but it has to have a reason. And getting students to describe that reason is a really important part of learning. With problem solving, I think a really big part of what hit me with problem solving is what was mentioned in the lecture about the fact of what can you do with facts? For me, history is all sorts of facts. I teach them facts about what has already happened. But facts are more than memorizing. Facts are just the tools in making, in making a, a full story. 
I want students to pick out the important piece of information, then string it together into a big concepts, into a big concept. So it's like they need to take these as small stepping stones to the final result. Um, the in steps in solving problems, we need to present students with a problem, help them to define the problem, develop the hypothesis, then test out those hypotheses, and then pick the best one. This week, uh, we had a lot of rain, and this, my athletes had to figure out how to get the pitching machine across the swamp of water over to our batting cage. So we, they had a problem presented. They defined exactly what their problem was. They developed a couple of hypotheses, ways to get that across there, and then they tested them out. And eventually, they pick out which, is one, which one's the best one so that they can use it in the future. That took along with problem solving is critical thinking in the textbook. Critical thinking imp is improving our ability to gather, interpret, evaluate, and select information for the purpose of making informed choices. Critical thinking is important because it's reflective and it's focused. Critical thinking is an important pro pro part of problem solving because critical thinking allows us to look at a problem and analyze it. I think critical thinking is more of the analytical side of the problem solving because critical thinking doesn't necessarily come up with a solution, but it helps us to evaluate the problem. I think these are really two important tools to have, especially when we look at history. Uh, I want students to see what the problem was, analyze, and critically think about that problem, solve the problem, and then hopefully apply it to their future.